Call of Duty Modern Warfare is here, and so is Mountain Dew. Roger that. Now you can unlock in-game rewards like only Dew can. Wait, what rewards? A Dew Operator Skin. Man, I love Operator Skins. Dual double XP, and even Call of Duty points. You're kidding me. Double XP and Call of Duty points? This is incredible. I can't believe it. This... Soldier, get a hold of yourself. Oh, roger that. Look for specially marked packaging and visit mtndugaming.com for details and restrictions. Open to U.S. residents, 17 plus. Call of Duty points available on 12 and 24 packs and free 20 and 23. Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Do you like professional wrestling? Well, we like professional wrestling too. Then to shake them ropes, I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. I am under the weather, but I'm here. I am not. I am energized. I am invigorated, and I am ready to talk to you about <laughs> wrestling and our sponsor this week, which is HelloFresh. More <laughs> on them in just a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I will I will do my best to power through. I apologize for any sniffling. But don't worry, there. people. I'm here with you. No matter how <laughs> infirmed Jeffrey is, I am here. We are on the struggle bus today, kids. Uh, I'm not. Jeff is. Come with me, Jeff. <laughs> Take my hand as we make our journey down this lazy river yes. that we call wrestling. Yeah. This low-rated lazy river hey. that we call wrestling. Hey. Oh, that were us. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> both. I, I, you know, the, this week both. This week both. Oh, we're we're low rate. Oh, darn. We got the. I mean, the, you know, our ratings have, have been kind of perpetual. We need more low. hot uh, takes, and we need someone like Denise Salcedo to get our ratings. <laughs> I've I've actually recently come around on the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega in the hopes that it'll pump the ratings. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, 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 and more on that in just a bit, people. Starting with. Uh, Pertinent to my interest because it's there. Uh, Barry Windham suffered a massive heart attack on December 2nd in Atlanta, underwent emergency surgery. But good news was today his family announced that he's out of the ICU. He's walking and responding to people. So that is very, very good news. He has a GoFundMe if you wish to donate to his medical expenses, because, of course, he does not have health care. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, Barry's been... Uh, having health issues for a number of years now and uh that that's a great relief especially given that he was in the airport when this happened he was in atlanta atlanta's big old airport there and suffered a massive heart attack jeez uh i i mean i think the thing that just breaks my heart is the need for people uh and people you would think would be in a position to afford it to have to do a gofundme yeah because- Medical expenses are so prohibitive and it's really hard to financially plan for a sudden five or six figure financial expense like that. And we're not talking about like low five figures, right? We're talking about like mid to high five figures. That's that's just hard to financially plan for, for even people who are well healed. Um, and it's just, it's just a sad statement. Uh, um, with the Mulligan family, it's always interesting because I, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, his father and brother were put in prison for uh, counterfeiting. 
<laughs> we all need money, Jeff. I know we all do. Get paid, everybody. It's just yeah, yeah, right. You know, like print money. Yeah, it's one of those things. Uh, uh, but look, if you if you've never had, if you are a youngin and you are listening to this show, and you are not aware of the greatness of one Barry Windham, or your only like exper- exposure to him is something like the West Texas Rednecks, which is fine. But please go check out anything of his between 86 and 89, maybe even 90. The uh, uh, any match. Of, he has two matches with Ric Flair, which are both fantastic. Uh, tag matches with Arn and Flair are fantastic. Uh, yeah, Barry Windham's just phenomenal. He's one of my favorite wrestlers. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say he's underrated but I, I he kind of falls into that slightly underrated category for me i feel like he's not in the conversation enough when when we especially when we saw, speak of that vintage well he's also a guy who never lived up to what they wanted him to be right right because but I, of, of all the guys who never lived up to what they wanted him to be i think he's actually the most talented like yes. like, like luger's kind of in that category and sting to a certain extent is in that category too i mean i know we now look at sting as a legend great success and everything like that but I, I think it's easy to forget the estimation on the guy from you know 87 to 95 that like sting never really quite took off as the baby face the scorpion version of sting that they had to make him the crow sting to really get him to latch on yeah surfer sting never took off never uh, took off yeah in, to, in i format. mean he was the top guy in wcw but he was never I mean, the, the, the economics of wrestling back then were all WWF. Uh, yeah, and, and Barry's thing was, <clears throat> I mean, he was pushed uh, as, I mean, the first time I saw him on TV uh, after, you know, they, they did the whole, uh, I, I originally saw him doing WrestleMania 1, don't get me wrong, but uh, I went back and I watched his first appearance on NWA television for Crockett. And they brought him in by introducing him as a guy who got a pinfall over Harley Race when that was a big deal and giving him a Corvette. So they were always true. I mean, he always had the star thing because, you know, Dusty and his dad were so tight. And but so, they yeah. They turned him a lot too, didn't they? They what? They turned him a lot though, too. He right? turned a bit. He jumped from place to place. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, and I then mean, he gained weight, which was, which, I was you know, easy. for a guy of his height is a death knell if you're a guy who's very uh acrobat like his drop kicks were always fantastic but once he gained weight he stopped doing them so right right yeah and, and really the the charm of Barry Windham was when he was mobile and big that like that yeah uh moving on to current wrestling Mike Johnson of PW Insider reporting that Sasha Banks as Mercedes Bernardo or Mercedes Monet would be at the Tokyo Dome show on 1/4 January 4th. That hasn't been confirmed. This is reading from the Wrestling Observer. That hasn't been confirmed past. We did learn that Kyrie versus Tam Nakano, winner of the IWGP title match on that show, is right now scheduled to defend the title on February 18th in San Jose. This is interesting because there's a lot of moving parts here and there's a lot of hype for some things that we don't still don't know where she's going to be because she could do this show and then do the rumble and then maybe Papa Triple H is letting her do some Japanese wrestling somewhere, you know, uh, maybe not in Japan, but maybe stateside. She might be a free agent. They're pushing this Soraya mystery partner at the LA show on January 11th. I don't think it's going to be Sasha Banks, which is going to be very disappointing to some people, but it could be Trinity slash Naomi. Because she was on social media this week with Jade Cargill hanging out. That's very interesting to me. But basically, right now, Sasha Banks is going to get to do what she wants because she has leverage and she is a star. And she does love Japanese wrestling in many ways. Uh, I find this very, very intriguing, to be honest with you, Chris. I don't know if you do or not. Yeah, I, I mean, I do. I, we are one step closer to Tony Khan mismanaging the booking of Sasha Banks in 2023, and how can you <laughs> prospect? Well, I I still think she's 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 under contract with WWE. That's that's my feeling. 
But yeah, I, I, I think the Papa Triple H is letting her do this. Also, the, the utility of Soraya teasing this mystery partner and it not being Sasha Banks. Uh, I mean, particularly if it's the former Naomi Trinity Fatu, uh, it sort of allows, in a weird way, the nerfing of the big reveal of whoever this is going to or be. Or Thunder Rosa. Or Thunder Rosa. Or a returning Chris Statlander. Or, you know, I mean... It's interesting, those choices within there. I was just like, wow, okay. But the other interesting thing to me is that New Japan is far closer and tighter. And I think on this January 4th show, there are very much rumors that the Bucks and Omega are going to be on this show. And so New Japan's kind of playing both companies against the middle there a little bit. Can't blame them for that. Can't knock the hustle. No. Uh... But yeah, I mean, we finally have an appearance, a wrestling-related appearance, because uh, WrestleCade had tried to get Sasha Banks and thought they could get her uh, and thought they had the money for it, but then she uh, she she rejected it. But it was... Uh, that's very interesting, because if anybody's been playing this game very, very well, it's her, to be honest with you. She's done a bunch of trademarks. She's gone into her own CBD oil business. She's now Queen of the South. Uh, but uh, but she's held her cards tight to the vest. She's been doing modeling in L.A. and Boston, but you don't really know where she is, and uh, I, I like the mystery of it, to be honest with you. No, I think it's good. I mean, it gets her market value up. Um, uh, if Tony Khan is able to land Sasha Banks, I think it is potentially one of the few people who could kind of jumpstart the intrigue around the division and hold, hold up to the Britt Baker scenario, so to speak, uh, that we've discussed in the past here. Um, you know, how, how do you handle being booked against Britt Baker? Sasha would actually be a really interesting person for that. Uh, I think she's doing a really good job leveraging herself. Although uh, my gut just tells me she ends up back in WWE. Yes. Ultimately. Yes. Might as well. Uh, William Regal, more information on his status. He asked for his release, and he is set to start with WWE at the first week of January 2023. There's rumors that there is an agreement that he will not appear on screen for as long as his contract original contract was, but he is allowed to coach. I hope Tony Khan got that agreement in writing. I do, because I... I... Look... You all probably have this. This is a this is a wrestling war. I could see Regal just saying, "Oh yes, you you have my honor and my word," and goes over there and immediately appears on screen as NXT Commissioner again, as if nothing happened. I'm sure Tony's a lot safer than that. I hope he is, because at his heart, look. I asked this question on the Dynamite Show because because they go, "Oh, I think I think Regal's a man of his word, and he'll uh, he'll uphold an agreement like that." I go. Why would you trust an old carny? Is it because he has a he has a I mean he was literally working in carnivals before he came to the states. And it's like just cuz he has a posh british accent you got to trust him on that? I think this is going to blow up in Tony's face to be honest with you. Yeah, uh I think that Regal played Tony Khan pretty hard here. Based Expound. off Based off of Tony Khan's availability with the press when he was asked about it, he said, you know, AEW is a family first business. I want to try to like get something really close to what his words were uh, so that I'm not like twisting them or mangling them too badly. AEW is a family first company. He talked about how he had been going through personal issues uh, and his mother had been in the hospital And that's when Regal spoke to him about this. And based on the backdrop of that, how could he turn down the offer to William Regal to go and spend time and work with his son, uh, knowing how important uh, sons are to parents and vice versa? I go, what makes Regal's relationship with his child any different than any other relationship between a wrestler and a child? Like, what, what makes Charlie Dempsey and William Regal so different than... Dominic Mysterio and Rey Mysterio or you know, Billy Gunn 
and Austin and Colton Gunn or any number uh, of other fathers and sons in wrestling. And William Regal, I think, made Tony Khan look like a weak boss and got Khan to, whether or not Regal appears on screen, he got Khan to agree to a really ridiculous standard that doesn't extend reasonably to anyone else in the locker room, has not extended that way in the past, would not make a lot of sense to extend in the future going forward. And I think that alone is a bit of a bit of a stroke by Regal and bit of a stroke for WWE. Now, once Regal got signed, I also remember WWE ended up putting out a video of Regal saying war games over and over again. So at bare minimum, I expect Regal's likeness to be appearing on the television. But then I'm kind of with you. Do we really think that the Charlie Dempsey booking pattern over the next year is not going to feature the mentorship of his father. Like, they're going to really go a disciplined 12 months on this. And that that gets me to my last point here on the ridiculousness of how Khan was played by Regal here. Ultimately, AEW had the ability to pick up William Regal's contract for another year. Like, the, the, the it was an option. And they have William Regal involved in this main event angle with MJF and it's 12 months of an extension. It is not as though William Regal 12 months from now could not go and mentor Charlie Dempsey. There is nothing pressing about this release, nothing urgent that needed to happen. It really felt like Regal timed and played a moment here. And I'm not saying that Regal's a bad guy for doing that even. I'm saying, if anything, I'm more saying that the whole, oh, Ta- Tony Khan's got a big heart. Oh, he, he's doing the right thing. Yeah, man, sure, maybe. But, like, he got played like a sucker here. Um, whether or not you want to call this a war or not, Khan got played like a sucker here because he needed Regal as an important engine to this. We'll talk about it more in the lazy river here, Jeff, but this not very good MJF main event angle. Uh, And the write-off of Regal has been extraordinarily choppy. It completely bonks a a lot of the main event picture in this company. So for all of these many reasons, I think that Regal really worked Khan here. Khan made a big mistake letting Regal out of this contract. This is not, oh, he's got a big heart. Sometimes your big heart can get you into trouble. Yes, I I don't even know if this is particularly big-hearted. Uh, of interest, and I'll, I'll give a little supplemental information here, were tweets by Brian Pillman Jr. and then comments by EC3. So the proverbial grain of salt here for EC3 especially. But Pillman tweeted out that <clears throat> Regal did a workshop for the AEW talent, and then a lot of the, quote, six-figure guys couldn't be bothered to show up. And then EC3 had some comments on a on a podcast earlier and, and said that Regal was frustrated uh, because of the immaturity in the back, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's two ways to take this. Uh, there's the CM Punk route where, hey, Punk's been telling us this too, and especially in regards to like Hangman's comments about uh, about guys giving advice and them saying, well, we'll do our own thing. But I also remember on a, on a table for three with uh, Sheamus and Cesaro that uh, that Regal said his proudest moment in WWE was the cross-dressing angle where he came out because people don't remember you for your good matches. They remember you for those moments. And I'm like, well, okay, if he's but, doing but a workshop... That was him working for the guy, Vince, who That's true, that. too. That's very, very, that's a very, very good point. That it might just be, you know, the WWE uh, culture. Right. That's that, also. Like, that, 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 that I just might have been a very politically correct statement from William Regal. I'm not saying he doesn't enjoy things like he's a real man's man, but I feel like there's a line between, like, he likes all that stuff, but I think he likes the serious wrestling too. I yeah, I mean, uh, like if it's a workshop on doing favorite. count, if it's a workshop on doing counters and things like that, yes, I'm all in on the regal. If it's a, it's a, if it's about uh, a show he was running a workman workshop on cross dressing. 
<laughs> Come on down, guys. <laughs> I have something very interesting to show you all. And he comes out heels and lipstick. Everybody, what the hell is that? I thought we were having a wrestling. <laughs> Looks like Tim Curry from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Let's go. <laughs> I, 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 I always have that workshop. Let's this is what wrestling is all about, sunshine. <laughs> You're like, what? Wait, what the hell? Put somebody in a cross face chicken wing right yeah, after. So that. And now, and now here's how you get here's how you make it snug. <laughs> uh, that would be a very William Regal workshop. And I, I mean, I, even that would be worth attending. Uh, so, like, look, uh, I mean, it's great as all with both these guys. I think the narrative or the 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 data points around cm punk let's call it the i work with children narrative yeah it grows a little bit stronger all the time um there there just there does seem to be a bit of a through line here um I, you know how much of that how much of that is being bitter how much of that is the truth uh that that time will tell but you know i i I think Regal was going to want to get out of there regardless. The second that Levesque was back in control of the company. Like, I mean, I don't think you ever yeah. would have been let go if Levesque, if there hadn't been the disempowerment of Levesque in, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021. Uh, I don't think he ever would have been let go in the first place. And I think the second that, you know, it's Levesque's ship, Regal wants to go back there because he's got 30 years of time equity with this man. Yeah, it's over half of his life. Yeah, like you, that means a lot. As you get older and older, that that's some of the only stuff that really matters. Weird numbers of viewership in this past week. A lot of them bad. One of them surprisingly good. I'll start with the good one. SmackDown on FS1 on December second did nine hundred two thousand viewers, and a point two five, three hundred twenty eight thousand eighteen to thirty four, and a point two oh. Yeah. Uh for FS1, that's a big number, especially when it's not on the regular network channel. Uh, that was pretty good. Now, Raw ran into the buzzsaw that is Tom Brady. Reading from the Wrestling Observer, Raw on December 5th set two bad records, but was actually up strongly in 35 to 49. Show averaged 1.5 million viewers, the fourth lowest number in the history of the show on USA Network. Show did a .41 in 18 to 49. That's 536,000 viewers. And .25 in 18 to 34. The show set three records with a 27.7% drop from the first hour to the third, being the largest drop in the history of the show. The second to the third hour tune out was 20.9%, also the largest in the history of the show. And the 1.2 million viewers in hour three being the lowest hour in the history of the show as well. Hour three was paced by Becky Lynch versus Nikki Cross versus Alexa Bliss main event. The third hour drew fewer viewers than any hour on shows on bat on, on, Bad television nights, such as New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, and July 4th, as well as shows this year on Sci-Fi when the show was moved for the Olympics. The only lower viewer numbers were July 5th, 2021, May 30th, 2022, against the NBA playoffs, and this past Halloween night. That's, I mean, that's substantial, Chris, but, you know, WWE is also in silly season right now. There's no pay-per-view in December. Everybody's waiting till the Rumble tune-up tune up starts. This is just kind of treading water. I am not that surprised, to be honest with you. I'm not that surprised. And grading on the curve of this is WWE's silly season, this has been a lot more watchable than silly seasons of years past. And I'm not saying that to defend the company. I'm just saying that as a point of fact, because the silly seasons in years past have been truly some of the worst television i've watched in my life making me question life choices like should i continue with this podcast yes can i keep this friendship with jeffrey going if we well keep that's it? still under yeah i know that one i'm still working on but like fortunately the show's <laughs> gotten like marginally better and, and and i don't have two stressors in my life now well i mean you know like the stressors have reduced you've gotten better the shows have gotten better things are better I've gotten better thank yeah, you you, uh, you have you, that you really you've grown on me like a fungus uh, it, I, I'm becoming quite <laughs> fond of you, Jeffrey. Uh, anyways, um, I still, at th that being said, like this, this week's raw lazy. I, no, 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 dude. I, I, I got I'll go further. 
I didn't actually make it through once we got to the poker stuff. And I was like, oh, it's just going to be like this tonight. Yes. Yeah. No, nah, I was like, nah, nah, I got other, I got other things to do. I, I, I can do other things. I'm going to do those things. And I did those things. And who uh, would like, think JBL would be a turnoff? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I know. Like, uh, th these are like the weird missteps in the Levesque era, like bringing back JBL. Like, uh, why? Like, who, who, for, for who is this for? It's not all sunshine and roses on the Friday night show for the other company. Rampage, 361,000 viewers. And the alarm bell has been sounded because John Moxley and Takeshita are main eventing Rampage this week. But yeah, that is a, uh, that is a low number, and I attribute that all to it to mostly being Ring of Honor stuff. Because people aren't tuning in for the Ring of Honor stuff. They're tuning in for AEW because it's AEW Rampage. That and the fact that, like, it's the second tier show, stuff. It's yeah. second tier stuff, and the show doesn't have a meta storyline that necessitates a run over. That, yeah. like, that, that there are key continuations of angles and of a broader storyline that you need to see on the next show uh i was thinking randomly while i was driving and doing work stuff this week like aces and eights popped back into my head and oh, like god right okay so like which I'll i be, liked i liked the original aces and eights concept right. it, and the aces and eights funeral is actually pretty good tv too yeah, uh, yeah the aces and eights funeral was real good but uh, obviously it overstayed its welcome and everything. But the one thing I can sort of say in defense for like aces and eights as a concept, not an execution. Um, I'm not saying like bring back Garrett Bischoff people. Don't please, please. But uh, what I can say is at least when TNA would do stuff like that or the main event mafia, it would give arc to the rest of the show. That like this thing touched the mid card, it touched the main event. Now they would crutch on it, it would go on too long, all of these sorts of things. You have to cycle these things out and come up with new things. But right now, AEW just has this very week to week McManny, like, you know, uh, what are we doing this week? I don't know. We're, we're doing something different this week. Uh, just it's very jam bandy in a way, too. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's just no, there's no editing. And and it it just ends up like why would I want to see a second show when Dynamite doesn't feel like a coherent album in the first place? Well, it's funny because the taped Dynamites or the taped Rampages always feel better to me, even though everybody goes, "Man, there's so much on this show." I'm like, "That's a good thing. It's an hour, and they cut and paste a lot of stuff to fit it in." The live shows to me, or the ones that they kind of tape live and just kind of meander a bit, they, those always feel like, okay, great. We're going to have another best friends match here type of a thing. You know? It, it, yeah, like, and the lack, me... of, the lack of stakes is a yes, huge problem. Yes, that's the other and, thing. And bringing Moxley and Takeshka only solves half your problem. Okay, there's no star power. Takeshka's a great wrestler. Moxley's the anchor of this company. But what is the point of those guys having a match? Exactly. And and what, what some fans will tell you, because I'm in a group called Fight Game Media, and, and people just rail against me every time I, I mention this type of stuff. Well, people just want good wrestling. Obviously not. No, they don't. It's It's arguable that people are just not really into wrestling, generally speaking, right now. And the data points across the board here suggest that this is a war between two countries that are losing population. Yes. Uh, Dynamite did 840,000 with a 0 .29, 381,000 in the 18 to 49, 0 .22 in 18 to 34. Uh, not a lot to say about that one either, but, uh, yeah, guess, it seems, you know, one other thing on the war metaphor though, right? Like I, the big difference between the nineties and now like this war, if we're, if we're going to kind of comp it like that is I don't feel like it's bringing out the best in either company. No. They, like, and they, that's they, what everybody they, said it would do. Stuff. Right. Oh, the, the competition will make everybody sharp. Ah, it's good. It makes everybody kind of go to their, uh, 
they're tried and true and those, and those you know and the, and when you keep doing tried and true week after week after week it starts to wear out the audience to be honest with you because like oh we've seen that before right right uh, personnel issues Try out this week at the Performance Center for only independent wrestlers. Kylie Ray and Casey Navarro were names listed by PW Insider. Appearing tonight on Rampage, spoiler alert, Trent Seven coming in as uh as oh, Boxhead. What's his name? Kip Kip uh Kip Sabian's uh opponent for Orange Cassidy. Tegan Knox made her return to the comp- to WWE last Friday on SmackDown. And what the hell did they do to Tegan Knox? Because I know that they want to make things bigger and brighter and everything, but Tegan they made Knox her is, rainbow brighter. Oh my god, her hair is all she's she's has the Marge Simpson makeup gun issue going on. You don't need that for Tegan Knox, guys. Come on. And then Shane Taylor, who just hey, that's ROH former TV champion Shane Taylor on Rampage, as if you know. If you weren't a Ring of Honor historian, you wouldn't know that. But he they, has been signed they for the Ring of Honor. Do Brand. introductions from like Poochie, the episode of The Simpsons, or with or Scooby Doo. Hey, that's TV's Jonathan Winters. Over yes, there. yeah, right. That, that's another good one too. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, it's Casey Kasem. Look, Jerry Reed, Sandy Duncan. Yeah, I just Tim Conway. Tim Conway. <laughs> And Don Knotts. Don Knotts also in there, yeah. Whenever the Scooby gang would run and do that celebrity thing, the Scooby-Doo movies, I think it was called. It's like, yeah, that's what they, they drive into a town. Hey, that's Don Adams. <laughs> From the TV show Dallas. From yeah. Get Smart, yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, that, 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 uh. But uh, we'll get into a little bit of Shane Taylor, I guess, in, in the, uh, final bow preview but that ends our new segment chris tell them about hello fresh okay i it, 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 it would nothing would bring me more excitement actually that's not true what would bring me more excitement is if i wrote a snappy jingle about this too Hello Fresh. It's America's number one meal kit. Hello Fresh. America's number one meal kit. All right, people. Pump it up. Pump up the jams. Pump it up because it is time for us to talk about Hello Fresh. What is Hello Fresh, you ask me? You're asking your podcast right now. I'm not there with you. I am in spirit, but not in presence. Hello Fresh gets you farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Got a stoop? That's where they're going to be. That's where that's where the 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 fresh Hello Fresh comes in. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on Hello Fresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. It's the most festive time of the year, people. That's right. That's right. You thought other parts of the year were festive? <laughs> no. No. You weren't having fun at all. Right now, this is peak you. And Hello Fresh is here to <laughs> Hello Fresh is here to help make the most out of every moment. From holiday hosting to dinners during the busy weeknights, you can count on Hello Fresh to deliver fresh ingredients and seasonal recipes. Tis the season for saving money. Fa la 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 wherever we can. Hello Fresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25 less percent less expensive than takeout fa la 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 so you can use those savings for holiday gifts or treat yourself or treat yourself treat yourself yeah you can hello fresh can help you eat better amid all the holiday temptations the bonbons get them out of here toss them you don't need them the fruit cake yeah you're gonna gorge no Toss that. You didn't want that anyways. You don't like fruitcake. Their meals have 20% 
fewer calories than takeout, so you can still have full flavor. Gotta love full flavor. Don't like medium? I want full flavor, just without the guilt. Now, earlier in the year, earlier in the year, I, let me let me drop a beat on you real quickly as, as we talk about this. Let, let's get that. Let, let's get that. Earlier in the year, Jeffrey, do you remember when we had Hello Fresh? Yeah, good times. Oh God, good times. So. If you are interested in HelloFresh, you go to HelloFresh.com slash V-O-W-16 and use code V-O-W, I'm sorry, code V-O-W-18. They, they change they changing the numbers on you, boy. Yeah. New copy. Changing the number. I'm gonna, I got to turn down the track here. I was bopping, and it makes it hard to read. I was shaking. I thought it was six, but it's actually an eight. V-O-W-18. Use code VOW18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. That is HelloFresh.com slash VOW18. Use code VOW18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. We'd like to thank HelloFresh for their sponsorship. Thank you, HelloFresh. Now, speaking of amid, we're on the lazy amid. river of wrestling criticism. <laughs> Anything that crosses our mind, such as more Barry Windham, we can talk about here. But we do have two previews to go through, which will help us get through the television of this week. First of all, NXT Deadline. Deadline NXT. Uh, I don't think that's actually the name of the title. I, I see Dead L1. N. Dead Lone? Dead l- 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 one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead Lone. Can't wait. I see Dead Lone. That's yeah, what we'll can't, wait. It. can't wait. Dead, <laughs> dead, lo- dead Loney. Yeah, Dead Loney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead Loney? It's now yeah. Italian. It's an Italian paper. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, they got, uh, they got, what's his name, Tony D'Angelo? <laughs> yes. From the Performance Center in beautiful Orlando, Florida, five matches set for uh, your enjoyment on Saturday night. Starting with the Jeff Hawkins special, Alba Fire versus Isla Dawn in a singles match. I can't, wait, up- can't wait. Um, I, yeah, I mean, let me ask you this. Let me ask How you this. Not, no, 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 no. You can't. Because I, I already said, let me ask you this. Sorry, so the, I, was pulling no, Chris, no, I was pulling a Chris Rock, so go ahead. I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but the floor was mine. All right. How much time do they give Isla Don and Alba Fire to really explore the f- space, and how many <laughs> stars do you think this match finishes off with? Oh, this is a two-and-a-half star special. Oh, okay. Uh, Fading it. Yeah, a little bit. Not because of Alba Fire. Um. Yeah, all right. So we're coming down hard on Isla Dawn here. I am a little bit because it's just you no. Know, this match is going to stink. I know it's going to stink. I was there's going to be spookiness, right? And and you know it's like okay. this is like not going to be a match. It's going to be a skitlet. Yeah, a little bit. And Isla Dawn's going to go over to establish her as a heel. Yes, and begin the angle between Alba Fire because and Isla Dawn. This is not going to be the end of anything. Yes. This is going to be the beginning of this, this feud, feud. Must continue. <sighs> Okay. On to more positive things, and boy, I am legit kind of hyped for this one, Chris. Pretty deadly. The team of Elton Prince and Kit Wilson take on the visiting New Day of Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods for the NXT Tag Team Titles. Now, the promos, they were okay. The match, I think, is going to be fan freaking tastic, and I cannot wait for this. I think Pretty Deadly probably went with some chicanery. But I'm kind of here for this match, Chris. Yeah, I think pretty deadly win with some chicanery. And I'm with you that the promo. Okay, I kind of like the promo. I like, liked it. I, I liked it a bit, but I didn't love it. I, I liked it. Didn't love it. Yeah, no, I'm with I'm with you. But like, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the interaction. And, and the first one. Yeah, like, you know, when they got surprised, it was good. But I think that this match will be equal parts well worked and funny. Um, and be kind of like a good example of like what a comedy style match is. I think New Day are well equipped to bring out both the wrestling chops of Pretty Deadly, who are fine. Now, are are they amazing? No, no, 
but but no, they're not. Um, but they're also not bad. I no, they're solid. They are. Yeah, they they're, are, yeah, they, they they definitely do many things well, if not amazingly. You know, like Tyler Breeze, they are not. But uh, I definitely think that they are more than capable enough of you know kind of being adequate in the ring and then they are good character actors and i think that they will be very funny in, in this sort of match and as opposed to putting them on main event or something if you want to see how they'll work on the main roster in a big situation there are worse teams you can put up there than the new day to have them go against yeah, ultimately, I do have questions about Pretty Deadly's ability to be anything more than like a mid card geek heel. geek heel team on the main roster. But yeah, yeah, but they might get the honky tonk man heat. You know what they I'm saying? Could. Yeah, you want to kick your ass this bad? Yeah, I can see them like with Miz. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, like Miz Miz managing Pretty Deadly would actually be a fine a fine act. For the NXT Championship, another match that I think could slap, as the kids would say. Braun Breaker, your champion, defending against Apollo Crews. Who you got, Chris? I got Breaker winning this. Yeah. But I will say, I've kind of enjoyed the weird tension between Crews and Breaker. Like, the fishing stuff and the coffee shop stuff, it's slightly goofy, but I think it's a fresh approach to baby face tension. Like, we're not trying to turn Cruz heel. So, how do you have Cruz establish that, like, he some a, a bit of a threatening presence to Breaker without, like, being hostile about it? And I thought that this this was good. Uh, the, they're and they're interesting foils for one another, and even where the the bits have fallen flat for me, I, I'm with you. I'm really intrigued for this match. I think this match has the ability to be very good. Yeah, I, I do as well. I, I think uh, Cruz has done some pretty interesting character work on here. I, it, it's almost like he had to uh, go back to take a drama 101 class a little bit. To, uh, to, you know, hey, what, what's the deal here? Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. At the Home Depot, we have plenty of Christmas trees to make your holidays even more magical. Hundreds of full, easy-to-assemble artificial trees that look so real, you may be convinced they actually are. And for those who love that fresh pine smell, we have a parking lot full of fresh-cut trees to call your own. We'll even help you load your tree in the car so you can bring home the holidays. The Home Depot. How doers get more done. WWE kind of thing, but I think uh, I think he's now malleable. I think he can play face or heel. Well, if they gave him the chance, I don't know if the main roster would ever give him that chance, but uh, well, they gave him a chance to play heel, but I think he could do it this time. I mean, not, not with not with not with not playing a uh, dis- deposed warlord of an African nation or something, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, one with depth. That's no, I, I mean. I'm with you. No, I know. I, 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 I was saying, I, as I said, I, I think he could do it without <laughs> an accent this time. Mm, that sounded and- good. And now the two Iron Survivor Challenge matches. The rules for this. Two wrestlers start the match in every five minutes. Another wrestler enters until all five participants are present. For a total, I believe, of 15 minutes. Is it 15 or 20? 15, I believe. There's 10, 1, 2, 3. Yes. After the last wrestler enters, there is a predetermined time limit. 
which they haven't told us yet. Each time a wrestler scores a pinfall submission or being the victim of a disqualification, they gain a point, and the wrestler they pin submit or who is disqualified then goes into a penalty box for 90 seconds. The winner of the match is the wrestler who scores the most falls at the end of the time limit. It combines elements of the championship scramble, Iron Man, and Impact Wrestling's King of the Mountain matches. This will probably be the first and last time that this is used on WWE television, but we shall see. First up, the women, Zoe Stark versus Cora Jade versus Roxanne Perez versus Indy Hartwell versus my favorite character, Kiana James, for the number one contender to the NXT Women's Championship. Chris, who you got? I think Roxanne Perez has to win this. Like a She's baby, the only baby the face only baby in this match. Facing, yeah, right. Like, it, it really should be Zoe Stark to showcase her newfound intensity. Yes. But given the fact that the champion is a heel, you need to have Roxanne Perez win this match. Yeah, it's gonna. this one's going to be... Uh, we'll see. It could be very good and over-deliver. Or it could just be bad. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm, 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 but I'm very interested. In it and, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with bad. I, I, I mean, it, it, I, I'll, I would love to be pleasantly surprised here, but my gut tells me this one's gonna stink. This one's gonna go about 30 minutes, and everybody's gonna have to keep track of all the spots and stuff like that. And they've been, I mean, you're gonna have a referee in there guiding them. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, do you trust Keanu James in a 30 minute match? Do you trust, Indy Hartwell in a 30-minute match, per se. I don't know, but uh, I think Roxanne Perez is the obvious choice here, and she should win this, hopefully. she She's the one, man. She has she has that, that knock-off-the-screen charisma. I just I just don't understand why sometimes they, they tend to damp it a bit. But, uh, yeah. Then on the men's side, a very interesting uh, lineup here at least for four of the five. Not sure about the other one, but he can work and he's solid. Carmella Hayes versus JD McDonough versus Grayson Waller versus Joe Gacy versus Axiom. Who you got, Chris? So, I think my one prediction is that JD McDonough's strategy is going to involve hitting people with chairs and, like, like getting down on points, basically. Like, there's, like, long game of, like, I will, like, hit you in the leg so that I can tap you out twice sort of thing. Uh, and it won't work for McDonough. So that leaves us with Hayes. I think it's going to be Waller. I, I, had, was... I had Waller as well, but yeah. you saying what you said, I think that's the exact strategy, and I think he comes back from it. I think it's like, oh, can you believe that J.D. McDonough is doing all these things and getting disqualified? He's getting too far down. He's getting too far down. And then at the end, everybody's so beat up that he gets a bunch of pins or or tap outs and, and wins this match. Close. I think he gets close, but I don't think he gets it done. I think Waller's still able to suck it out. I think it's one of the three of Hayes, McDonough, or Waller. I was right. leaning towards Waller. But, but do we need to go back to McDonough is, is sort of my whole thought. Like, like why would we go back to J.D. McDonough? Because they've been time? building it a bit on the TV. Mm, perhaps, perhaps. Um, but I think Grayson Waller is a more interesting choice here, or Carmelo. Now that he's, yeah, I think Carmelo would be a great number one contender, building for the big one, and then get him up to the main roster sooner than later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I mean, Melo and Breaker will have a fire match too. Yeah. So that's it for that. Let's do uh, let's do some lazy rivering of AEW or. If you have anything else on main roster WWE before we get into the ROH pay-per-view, we'll do that last. I guess the only uh, other thing that's not, you know, pertinent or or not in the pay-per-view NXT that I wanted to mention is I like the dynamic of Ivy Nile sort of butting heads with the uh, Creed brothers. Like, I just think like a lot of the stuff that they're doing with Diamond Mind is good intrigue for... It's layered. Yeah, it's good layered intrigue for a babyface stable where like, they have tension, but it's not like tension that necessarily needs to go to a match. It's just like they're not always on the same page. And you can kind of understand one guy's motivations and you can understand her motivations. And like, yeah, no, I, I it's just almost like the, the, the thing I love about and you, and you brought this up perfectly, but I'll, I'll expound a little bit on it is that 
this was originally a heel stable. And and Roderick Strong is famous for turning on people and stuff like that. So you're getting the nuance kind of one of my favorite comic books is, is a comic book called Thunderbolts, where it was the Masters of Evil took over for the Avengers when the Avengers were all kind of disappeared from Earth. And then some of them learned that they liked being good guys. I think that's kind of a lot what this is. I mean, these are all alphas butting heads in a stable, but still trying to be good guys. And it's and it's and it's 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 inter- intriguing from week to week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially given the fact that, like, you know, I, I think Ivy is the most interesting of them because, like, if you remember, Ivy was the one who looked at Sangha and was like really disgusted with him. So it's not like she doesn't want comeuppance with Sangha. It's just like she's got a different strategy than the Creed brothers. And she has friends outside of the Diamond Mind. Right. Too, right. Which is very interesting. It's like usually when they do these clicks, it's like these are the only people we hang out with. No, I have friends over here that I kind of like, uh, like to be things. with. I'm sorry to step on you, but there's no, go ahead. a lot of things to be negative about NXT 2.5 on still. It's not black and gold. It's not living up to that. And I would never tell you that it isn't. I just like also think that when we're doing criticism, it's worth observing what is new novel. And I think like a step in the right direction. Um, I heard it. A lot of this stuff compared to the level of sophistication of like, teenage uh nickelodeon from the 1990s yeah okay i'm fine with that because that's a step above where we were at last year which was like television for an eight-year-old you know ray mysterio getting his eyeballs you know like literally falling off of a roof roman reigns actually saying suffering succotash like looney (laughs) tune i I mean you know like I think it's easy to look at what's not working right now and forget that you do actually have to compare it to how bad things were once at one point, not all that long ago. So let's um, do oh, let's do ahead. AEW. Let's do let's it. do AEW or any mainstream WWE that you have that that's lingering. I don't know if you do. I, I have nothing more to say on Raw. I will start our Lazy River with William Regal and this promo that was hyped. To say this will explain everything. This is lame, Chris. This is the season finale or the series finale of Lost. Yes, I mean, or, or this is the end of the after school special where, and in his death, he taught us the most important message of them all to hope. You know, or, or Robin Christmas. Wo- yeah, or Robin Williams coming back to his classroom just to pick up his stuff. And Dead Poet Society, and all it needed was was the Deadpool Combat Club or the Blackpool Combat Club to stand on desk and say, "Oh, Captain, my Captain." It it was absolutely ridiculous. So so let me get this straight: Regal basically screwed Moxley and took money out of his child's mouth to basically make Max paranoid. What well, one step further? He he called him back from vacation. He was supposed to be on vacation. He wasn't even supposed to be here right now. But Regal's plan required that Moxley have to come back from vacation and then lose the title. You know what this needed? This needed this needed Regal to walk off into into the distance and fade out. <laughs> like a ghost. Like I I it I mean this obviously did not work for me at all. Oh, no, this was terrible. Uh, th- this is this is terrible. This didn't make any sense at all. They had weeks to come up with this. They knew that, like, the, the Regal thing clearly had been in the works for some time, uh, according to Khan. He was, like, patting himself on the back for how he's, you know, masterfully reshuffled all these angles. This is dumb. And, like, Moxley's a little redirected, like, we all live and breathe pro wrestling. Like, I, I am sorry. This does not make me root and cheer for John Moxley. It's not John Blackpool Moxley. Talking Club. It's like, well, talking helps gets people over if you haven't noticed, John. Uh, well, and talking tells coherent stories. Yes. Yeah, you know, you you need you need to talk sometimes to tell a story. So, like, no, I get what he's saying. It's not Blackpool Talking Club, but like in this case, that felt like a crutch for this story. Really sucks. So let me get back to wrestling because at least people like me when I do that. Um, but this, this was very, very, very bad. And I just, I think that 
and the Stark and Stark's interaction with MJF, I, I just think all of this does not bode well for the main event angle right now, which is all centered around MJF. If you want to sh- switch over to MJF and Starks, I actually liked. I thought Stark. I want to be clear here. I think Starks gave the promo of his life here. Okay. No, no. I'll, so I think this is great. I just think that like MJF kind of you know got a little bit exposed here, and like like the MJF shtick I think is going to start to wear thin very quickly. Actually, the thing that I noticed was how much taller Ricky Starks was than MJF, and I always thought Starks was tiny because you'd see him you know kind of thin and doing the profile type, and you're like, man, he's so small, and then he stands next to MJF. You're like, oh wow, but. My problem with the MJF promo, I was nervous about it because it was treading on that I'm burying you type of thing by breaking the fourth wall a little bit too much with the NWA reference and, hey, you stole all your shtick from The Rock type of thing, which, hey, we've said on this show, that's what he was doing. So that was understandable, but it's 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 different when you actually say it on TV and maybe the people get into that Uh and then Starks came out. The Pebble cut. thing. The Pebble yeah. thing was bad. That was not a oh, good. Was thing. it? I kind of. I, I kind of like. No, it. no, no, no. Um, uh, the Pebble thing was bad in the Convinced sense me. that the crowd started chanting, chanting Pebble. Yes. Pebble. Yes, yes, that was a problem. That was a problem. No, yes. no, like that. That's certifiably a problem. I know. I, I thought it was. It, you could certainly argue it was effective. Yeah. No, like the crowd latched on to Pebble. But yes, like, the crowd chanting Pebble. I went, oh no. And then especially Starks not saying anything at that time and kind of smiling and having to take it. I, yeah, I, I don't, oh, I don't, no. I don't you know. I, I was worried he was going to kind of stall out there, but then like Starks got on the bike and, and I loved Ricky Starks's roast session because, okay, he wasn't perfectly articulate. There were times where he was talking too fast and not fully enunciating his words and everything, but I loved when he just started unloading on MJF and it stopped even being full sentences. It was just like bad scarf. Like, and he, <laughs> 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 like I, it was it stupid was stupid really, haircut. Yeah, stupid haircut. Bad scarf. Like jeans don't fit right. Like just, his bullet points came into his head. It was so great. I I like it. It was it was great and consistent with the absolute character. And I think the other thing that Starks did that was an absolute home run for me was he he was annoyed that MJF thought he was better than him the whole i'm better than you and you know it thing should and does drive the absolute ricky starks character absolutely crazy because ricky even as a baby face his confidence is under or underpinned by this belief that like you know being absolute like he is the total package like he's the best he should be champion and, and i think it like works great for his character and it saves something that was like right on the edge. No, I, I thought Starks, this is the best promo I've ever seen him do. Um, I just, I worried about it a little bit. Cause it's like, once he started roasting MJF, okay. Like, yes, MJF does need to start being dressed down, but like this Burberry belt stuff and a lot of the MJF, like the fifth rate Roddy Piper thing. And the fact that so much of MJF's promo really does consist of these these cheap heat things that I do think have a short shelf life. And while it was good and I'd even argue necessary that Starks like redirect from that pebble with some like heavy ammunition, and he did, um, I, I think that it only belies the fact that longer term, this Burberry belt crap is, is just not a one year main event sort of angle. It's something that I think will be struggling in six months. I like that he called him cheap. I did too. Because it's, it's, it's shades of the feud that got me into wrestling, which was Flair versus Blanchard. And Flair would come out and go, you're just, you buy department store suits and stuff like that type of a thing. Where, where for me, where Ricky's promo got off track a bit, and I know what he was trying to do so I can understand. He, he went a little dusty roads here. When talking about the responsibility of the champion. The problem is twofold here. It took the focus away from the one-on-one feud between Starks and MJF and talking about more esoteric 
you know, thematic thing. You know, it was more of a philosophy discussion. Yeah, you, you fail the philosophy of championshipness. Yes, which I didn't like. I just want this feud to be about these two guys don't like each other. And the other part of that that made it ring hollow was he was talking to MJF as if MJF really wanted to be a baby face. And you're like, no, the whole point was he was a fraud from the beginning here in terms of getting cheers and stuff like that. Now, you can call him a fraud, et cetera, et cetera, but him talk, I mean, he doesn't care about the responsibility. He cares about the money and the leverage it'll give him to get more money. So talk about that. If you're going to go esoteric on it, a better good, uh, you know, theory and stuff like that, like he's a philosopher or stuff like that. But, but it totally drew the focus away from the heat between these two just kind of snarking on each other. And that's where kind of, I went, first half of the promo was fantastic. Second half of the promo, I went, ah, okay. That's a choice, but I didn't care for it all that much. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. Um, I, I the, the stuff that worked really well is the stuff that centered around Starks' character and the stuff that, for me, fell flat was, you know, the the honor and tradition. Of, it's just not authentic to Ricky Starks' character. Right. Even Ricky Starks' connection with the people. He's not like the man of the people. Uh, you know, The Rock did the whole people's champ ironically because the whole thing is like I put my arm at the length of the people and hence I call myself the people's champion. Even when the people finally embraced him, it's not like he ran out into the stands very often and stood with the people. Like, that's not what's going to make Starks. Starks needs to be cool. And cool does not need to be in the crowd like that. People can love you from a distance. Like a, yeah. a really cool person people do that with. And yeah, I, I people think. People like yeah. confidence. Right. And yeah, I, I again, I, I thought the stuff that was sufficient and, you know, excellent is the stuff of I'm absolute. And this whole you're better than me or you know, and I know it thing. No, I will never know that. You will literally never get me to say that. Um, and I think, honestly, that that can be a driving thread for this whole feud where it drives MJF crazy that Ricky Starks would never say that MJF is better than him. And for Ricky Starks, it motivates him, you know, deeply to prove to MJF that like or and to himself that no one's better than him. I have two other AEW points here that are not related to the Ring of Honor card. Let's do it. Uh Darby Allen had himself a week, I thought, between last Friday's Rampage and uh, Dynamite. I like Cole Carter a lot. I thought he brought quite a bit of Billy Zabka charisma in terms of 80s, 80s jock villain type of thing in his offense in that match, in losing. I think WWE made a mistake in dumping him. All two dimes. Uh, I, I like that a lot, and I loved... I love that they did the Joe walk away spot for him diving towards the barricade. <laughs> I I watched that at least 20 times, howling every time at Darby running full speed and Joe just walking away and hearing the crash and just kind of smiling. I thought that was fantastic. I liked this match so much that I found myself going what is the point of any of these other feuds that these guys are involved with yes. right now when Darby Allen and Samoa Joe is clearly the more intriguing match? I don't think Wardlow and Samoa Joe can get to this level of intensity because the reason this works is that Darby is killing himself for Joe. Yes. And Joe's got, you know, his working boots on and it works really good as a heel, but like he's not having to do like the crazy bumps. You know, it's not 2006. Joe's pacing himself. And that's fine. I'm not begrudging him or anything like that, but it works because you've got this younger guy. And like, I don't need Wardlow running into a barricade. I actually, I mean, the whole mystique of Wardlow is kind of predicated around the idea that you can't really do that with him. Like the Wardlow Joe match really should be something like Joe, after looking like a hoss, thinks that he's just going to run through Wardlow like a buzzsaw and Wardlow upsets him in fairly short order. Uh, he's sort of surprising and overwhelming Joe, who's, been built like a monster for six months like that match actually shouldn't be all that long and it should mostly be Wardlow dominating Joe um who comes in looking like a murderer uh, and for me, the interesting thing would be Samoa Joe and Darby Allen continuing this feud and then my other one Chris did you get my text message on Monday yeah I did but I didn't do the homework oh Chris for those of you who don't know because you wouldn't know because you're not on my text messages 
AEW Dark Elevation, about 19 minutes in, the most glorious tag team I have ever seen came on my screen. Turbo Floyd and Truth Magnum, the Outrunners, straight out of 1985 Memphis. Brother, I am here for this act. I want a best of 31 against FTR. Their look is so, so Steve Kern balding towards the end of the fabulous ones run. Chris, they got the they got the blonde bleach blonde hair, but it's balding or a or a or a mullet. And I think actually Turbo Floyd is a balding mullet. So we, the, we, call, we call that a skullet. With the dark skullet. With the dark beard. Oh, it is so skeevy and so awesome. And they can work too. They're gr- they're pretty good. I I liked them a lot. But even Matt Menard goes, are these guys from Memphis? I howled at this. They are they are everything I want in a low grade B tag team. And they are superb. Go out of your way to watch this. I hope they get signed. I absolutely adored them. They were great. I'm sorry you did not do the homework so that you could expound on this with me. But a lot Steve Kern vibes, Doug Summers vibes. Uh, you know, like I said, it, it's just, it, 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 they're wearing Oakley blades. I mean, you're just like, my God, it's like, like, I like Anthony green, but his throwback shtick is a little too ironic for me. These guys have gone all in and it's fantastic. Nice. Nice. So, uh, anything else from uh, AEW before we go into Ring of Honor or anything else? Um, do do do. Let me see here. Um, anything else on? Uh, other than, I, I just really question the wisdom of doing this like best of seven thing with a uh, Death Triangle and uh, even though with the Bucks, I'm just like, man, we have more of this. Uh yeah, we're we're just doing this every week here. Well, at um, least you had a week respite from it because they weren't on this week. Right? But... No, I know, but like it, it's it, we had we had a week respite from it, but like it's still just like wow, there's even more of this. Um, re- otherwise, like I don't know, like for me, this is kind of like yeah, the tag match wasn't bad. You know, Claudio and Yuta versus Garcia and Hager was fine. Um, just it's a show where like. Uh, no big stories that I'm super invested in right, right. now. And, and it's really hard to like... Except MJF and Starks, but that's you, the one you're supposed right, to be interested in. MJF and Starks just kind of caught fire this week for me. Okay. Uh, yeah, like that wasn't a thing that I was like jazzed about a week ago even. um, and that That's like Ricky sort of like had his moment and... I, I think, you know, he, he had the moment that everyone was saying Wheeler Yuta had against MJF. Like, Starks actually had that moment of standing, you know, toe-to-toe with MJF and, like, not getting outshined by him. And that got me excited for the match. Uh, it, it, it doesn't... I wouldn't say that I'm... Me being excited for the match doesn't necessarily make me excited for the angle. Right. You know, I, I still think, like, MJF betraying Regal... Okay, let me ask you this, Jeff since they clearly thought this whole William Regal thing out so much. So how does MJF process the idea that William Regal gave him the belt as an Achilles heel poison pill? Insult it and blow it off, which gives it no emotional resonance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's like sort of no way to actually thread that needle. It's either it becomes the source. of It's apathy. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of uh, love. Yeah. I mean, the more interesting move would be it now becomes the driving paranoia throughout the entirety of his title reign. Yeah, and I, I don't think that would be a good No, move. no, and I don't, I don't think they have the narrative discipline to write that. Like, you'd have to really be thinking ahead about, okay, how does MJF's constant belief that Regal doesn't think he's good enough to be champion cast a shadow over the entirety of his title reign? Well, Maybe- they, well actually, no, you just hit the nail on the head here because cowardly heels don't get over all that much. I mean, you can have a little, you're, you can have a little bit of coward in you, but like all the great heel champions for the most part, 
were guys who could go too. I mean, yeah, they cheated to get their way, but if if you're gonna make him a coward and paranoid, he's just gonna be the Miz with the title. Yeah, but then like it's he also needs a rosebud like motivation. Yeah, the great champions. I mean. Okay, yeah, Hogan sort of, you know, Hogan and Bachman, I wouldn't say like had rosebud motivations, but like, I don't know. I I think you Flair know, you, liked money. Yeah, Race exactly. liked money. That's the yeah. only reason they went for the titles all the time. <laughs> and also, they could then call themselves "I'm the best in the sport of professional wrestling" type of thing. But right. They really wanted the money. It was all for the money. Right, and that's not particularly interesting with MJF's character. No, because he's already rich. Right, he's already rich. So like like that that unfortunately does not become a really interesting motivator. Wow, and you have you have found the weakness in there, Chris. I congratulate you on that. Thank you. Um and so then yeah, what is it? I they, they I really he's a legitimate wrestler on the level of Brian Danielson. Is he gonna be pulling that one? Right. No, I and then like how do you, you this this is the problem. Like you you have six months here where this guy's just gonna come out there talk crap about the local sports teams um and, and call yeah. people poor call people mid right yeah and yeah and it's yeah it, is that enough wow. is that is, you yeah. you have completely broken me on mjf now I'm sorry <laughs> about that um, i know i'm usually the negative one here i was like oh man he's right damn it so there, anyway. There's something, I mean, there's in, something intriguing there. But the, the sad part is, like, even with the Regal write-off, they could have actually planted the seeds for the, you know, that this whole thing with Regal, like, it, yeah, it, it festers at him. And that, that, that can manifest in different ways at different times or whatever, but we always have this constant through line of, like, the shadow of Regal. Yeah. But, but yeah, otherwise, it's like, why does he want to be champion so bad? No, no, you're, you're exactly right on that one. That, uh, God. <laughs> I'm now frightened by that, Chris. Anyways, final battle occurs on the afternoon before dead one or deadline. Seven matches scheduled, one being set up at the end of Dynamite that I'm gonna I'm gonna rant a little bit on that one. But starting with Dalton Castle and the boys taking on the embassy of Brian Cage, the Gates of Agony, Bishop Khan, and Toa Leona, with Prince Nana, who of course bought them all from Tully Blanchard. For the ROH six man tag team titles. Okay. Um, one more time with the participants. Dalton Castle and the Boys versus the Embassy. I'm gonna go with Dalton Castle and the Boys. I think this entire card is to kill off any AEW involvement whatsoever. I think Dalton Castle and the Boys do win this one. Uh but yeah. Uh that'll be a match. Swerve in our glory, the team of Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee taking on Shane Taylor Promotions, Shane Taylor and J.D. Griffith, or as Renee Paquette said, hey, your former ROH TV champion Shane Taylor. In a tag match, does Keith go full heel here finally? I don't know what we're doing here. I, I'm confused on how Swerve in our glory is back on the same page after the slap in the face moment at the last pay-per-view. Yeah, he's just sitting there smiling. Staying there smiling as Keith goes, okay, you're my partner. It's so strange. Uh, that This is a team that was once very intriguing, and and I, I don't know what you do. Uh, I, I think they end up breaking up here. So I think they lose, and that like they finally break up. I think Lee turns and they win. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, they do the thing that they should have done weeks ago? Yes. That would be, a very, AEW, that would be a very AEW thing. Yeah. Samoa Joe versus Juice Robinson for the ROH World Television title. Now, I'll give some props here. I liked the vignette that they played of Juice Robinson on Rampage last Friday. It was great. It introduced him. Said everything you need to know about this, him. With the exception of showing, like, moves and stuff. Even though, yeah, he's been on AEW TV. Don't get me wrong, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, though, but Juice Robinson should have been on AEW television getting a really ass-kicking win here this yes. week, not Samoa Joe. Like, yes. like I, as much as we liked the banger between Joe and Darby, 
Robinson needs to be the one looking like a credible threat. And I go, I come out of that match going, there's no way in hell you could get me to put any money on Juice Robinson winning this match against Samoa Joe, no matter how ridiculous the odds are. And like, yes, you, you know, I, you could get me to laugh and be like, come on, Chris, not even five, not even five. And eventually just to get you to stop complaining at me, I'd give you $5 and let you go and put it on Juice Robinson. But there's no way you could ever get me to think that Juice Robinson had a chance of winning. And it would have been hard even if he had had a showcase match this week on Dynamite, but he needed to be the one having that. Not He needed to be the one beating Darby Allen. That would have been a big thing for Juice Robinson. And last time we saw him, he was emissary of the Bullet Club doing work for Jay White. And here he is, the baby face against Samoa Joe. It's a little confusing. I get shades of gray. I get that, but all right. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I w- you know what? Joe is the TNT champion. If Juice has only been signed to Ring of Honor, I'd give it to Juice, but I think some of Joe does take this. Yeah, I, I think they, they want to keep Joe strong. I don't think Joe's losing. Mercedes Martinez versus Athena for the ROH Women's World title. I guess Mercedes is a baby face again, which who knows these days because they screwed her up so much on AEW. We don't know. I do like Athena's born again, hardcore, just bell rings and she just gives a forearm shiver to a girl. This is the most interest I've been in the former Ember Moon in quite some time. And I'm kind of here for this match. I like both women. I like Mercedes. She always kind of brings badass sensibility to it. Uh, who you got, Chris? I am going to go with Mercedes. I'm going the other way. I think Athena takes this. Okay. Uh, I think they are going to announce a streaming deal of some sort for Ring of Honor. Who knows where or what service. But I think she's going to be the champion once uh, Ring of Honor starts there and gets taken off of AEW TV and gets moved over there. That's just a feeling. Okay. For the ROH Pure Championship, Daniel Garcia versus Wheeler Yuta. And I'm going to say something very shocking and something that's uh, going to tick off a lot of modern-day wrestling fans. I have no interest in this match. Both guys have been cooled off so significantly. Neither bring... of them are interesting right now. They're right? not like, interesting. They're, they're, they're not interesting in the slightest, yes. And I could give a crap, to be honest with you. But It would I think... be a thousand times more interesting if... Garcia was the baby face and Yuta was the heel at this point. Yes. And the non-committal, you know, sort of presentation of both of these guys has made for a match that will probably be extremely well worked and have absolutely no intrigue to me at all. They're, they're two red ahead. shirts for other guys in their stables. Uh, I'm going to flip pick. Looks like Daniel Garcia is winning. Why do you say that? The pick landed uh, face side down. Oh, you actually flipped a pick. Okay. Yeah. 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 But so. <clears throat> and then in a match that has four days worth of build, three days worth of build. Oh, that's the other thing we didn't go over. So we'll have to go over it now. But FTR, the team of Cash Wheeler and Dax Harwood, favorites of Shake Them Ropes, take on another favorite of shake them ropes the briscoes jay briscoe and mark briscoe in a double dog collar match for the ring of honor world tag team titles announced via their proxy the gun club after what i thought was possibly the acclaim's best match ever i know people love the swerve uh the 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 swerve keith lee match don't get me wrong it was hotter but i think in terms of in-ring work i think ftr brought out the best of the acclaimed on Wednesday I completely, I completely agree. It's very clear that FTR understands the acclaims act and how to present them in a way that, you know, made them look great. And I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I thought that this match really brought out the best of the acclaimed and that's, that's FTR doing that. But I, I thought it was very, very good. Chris, you do not uh, have the Twitter anymore, which makes it hard for me to send you things, but Jay and Mark cut a fire promo. Uh, yesterday on this and uh, 
this is almost getting me to want to buy the pay-per-view, to be honest with you, because I am here for this. I think Jan Mark Briscoe are crowned ROH World Tag Title Tag Team Champions because it's not a wrestling match. It's a fight, and that's a good way to get the titles off of FTR. Yeah, I, I I think that that very well could be the case. They had no chance to plan for it. This is sort of an ambush thing. It gives FTR a lot of narrative outs for why they lost these titles. They were absolutely unprepared. Yeah, yeah they, they, they could be losing the titles here. And AEW just doesn't seem to like want to do the full give FTR all the belts, all the belts storyline. Yeah. My God, get the Briscoes on Dynamite cutting promos, please. It would drive the ratings, I think, because that's what drives ratings is great promos. Ah, I get it. A lot of people left Warner Brothers Discovery this week. I hope one of them was a person who doesn't like the Briscoes. That's what I hope. That is my, that is my Christmas, Christmas wish, Chris. I hope so. I hope so. And then, finally, for the Ring of Honor World Championship, Possibly the greatest Ring of Honor champion ever, according to them. This is the story they're going with. Chris Jericho defending against Claudio Castagnoli. And if Claudio loses, he has to join the Jericho Appreciation Society. The problem with this match is that everybody wants to see Claudio wear the hat. And the more interesting choice is for him to join the Jericho Appreciation Society versus being the champion. Want to know why? Because we've already seen him as Ring of Honor champion. Yeah, but if they do that, we're going to be doing the Matt Hardy storyline. Yes. In, yeah, like, this is the problem. Like, AEW only has... Three hits. Three hits. And they play those hits over and over and over again. I'm the reluctant member of the heel stable. Uh, you know, uh, what, what's the, what are some of the other ones? I'm here? the guy who's about to turn on his tag partner. I'm the guy, yeah. Um, Whatever the Jade Cargill angle is, too. I feel like we do that one a lot. Oh, um, that 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 I'm the star and all you guys are my flunkies and I'm going to turn on you eventually. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it, they they just have not been the will he or won't he, uh, will she or won't won't she storylines from the last pay per view. I I I guess Claudio ends up in the Jericho Appreciation Society. And yeah, because he hasn't been built up enough to beat Chris Jericho. No, right. And then we get yuck yucks with Claudio. Can't yes. wait for that. And then he screws them in certain matches and stuff like that. And oh, it's like look. Matt Hardy. I, I, the it's it's Wardlow. It's also Wardlow and MJF when they were about to Ward turn. Low. It. Yeah, right. It's Wardlow and MJF. Yes, Wardlow. You know, sabotages MJF at key little points. Yeah. So that'll do it. Anything else on the Lazy River you wanted to bring up this week? No, uh, I think we're good here. Then we will end it there, and I'll get myself some uh, cough medicine. It's been Shake Them Roast. We are sponsored this week by HelloFresh. Use code VOW18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. You can follow me at CrapGame13. You can follow the show at Shake Them Roast. You can follow Chris on the Instagram at Dr. One word, underscore Nove, correct? That is Absolutely correct, Jeffrey. Dr. Underscore Nov. Uh, we are part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Feel free to listen to the flagship, uh, Open the Voice Gate, Music of the Mat, uh, and other shows for all varieties of wrestling interest. Chris also gives guitar lessons, and he has other plugs to give, so uh, he can give them now. Yeah, if you are looking for online guitar lessons, please feel free to hit me up on Instagram.com. With the holidays coming up, now's a great time to sign up for remote lessons. Uh, we can do them via Zoom or via FaceTime. It, hit me up, Dr. Underscore Nove. And I don't, I don't know, don't have anything else really to plug right now. Don't worry about the government's on, on a break right now until I get to the other side of the move. We'll probably get back to doing business at some point next year. You can also hear me every Wednesday late on the dynamite show on the fight game media network patreon.com slash fight game for five bucks paul fontaine and myself give hot takes about aew about 15 minutes after the show goes off the air and then it drops later that night but anyways this has been shake them ropes we'll be back next week see you then those big wireless companies try to lure you in with a new phone just to lock you into a contract not simple mobile 
If you have a great smartphone you love, you can get a powerful nationwide 5G network without the contract. Just text the word BYOP to 611611 to see if your phone's compatible. Simple Mobile. Out with the old, in with the simple. Message and data rates may apply. Visit simplemobile.com slash privacy policy for privacy policy and the terms and conditions at simplemobile.com slash terms and conditions. Compatible 5G capable device and SIM required. Actual availability, coverage, and speed may vary. 5G network not available in all areas. 5G upload speeds not yet available. This holiday, whether you're making a Kroger Simple Truth Turkey for 40 or a Murray's Baked Brie for two, Kroger has fast, fresh delivery and free pickup so you can make holiday meals that bring you all together to create memories that last. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Free pickup on orders of $35 or more. Restrictions may apply. Get more ways to save at the Buy 5 or More Save $1 each sale. Just buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with card. Kroger, fresh for everyone.